Good morning. Take your Bibles and open up to 1 Corinthians chapter 1. We're going to be looking at the first two verses of 1 Corinthians chapter 1. A couple of uh, bits of background information before I have Christy come up and read this passage. Um, as I mentioned earlier, Corinth was a very, very corrupt town. There's a reason for that. It was a very, very prosperous town, um, uh, involved in a lot of the commerce, especially in the commerce that went from east to west or west to east. Um, they basically had to go through Corinth to do that. Corinth was, between, is it Adriatic? Aegean, in Adriatic seas. I think it's on both sides of Greece. Two seas on both sides of Greece. And it's a, basically a peninsula, except there's a, a, a cut in the peninsula where it goes down to only four and a half miles wide. That's where Corinth was. So basically, ships, small ships, could come up to uh, Corinth, unload, take the ship across land, and put it in the sea over here, and it saved them all sorts of time. Plus, going around the south side of, of the uh, peninsula of Greece was very, very, very uh, hazardous. In fact, there was a saying in Greece that went like this, let him who sails around Mela forget his home. Mela was the peninsula they were sailing around to go around Greece. There was also a saying that said this, let him who sails around Mela first make out his will. So apparently it was very, very treacherous. And so in order to avoid that particular stretch of seas, they would take the boat, port it, unload it, pick up the boat with slaves, obviously, take the whole boat, the four and a half miles, and then put it in the sea on the other side. It took about a day or so to do all that. Guess what the sailors were doing during that time? Partying. Corinth was an unbelievably corrupt town. As I mentioned earlier, there were a thousand prostitutes for Aphrodite, um, Venus, if you're depending on the Roman or Greek, um, up on the hill. And then in the city itself, there was a temple to Apollo. They had hundreds of male prostitutes that would satisfy the needs of both male and female worshipers. So if you wanted to worship, you engaged in sex. That was the way you worshiped these Greek gods. That was to stimulate them, to uh, excite them so that they would work in your favor. That was the thinking. Paul comes in, preaches the gospel, and he has to work against this whole mindset. What they saw as worship, the apostle Paul sees as a horrible sin. And so that's one of the major things that he has to work against is this whole idea of uh, involved in those kind of immoral, immoral uh, activities Far from worship as far as the Judeo-Christian perspective is concerned, but Paul has to fight against that. There's also um, all sorts of other things going on um, with the Corinthian people. In fact, they were so corrupt that we would call a person a scumbag or a dirtbag or something like that. If they're really immoral. They call them Corinthians. If we might say somebody that was from the hills would say well, they're a hillbilly, you know, meaning they're kind of backwards in the way they do things. If somebody called you a Corinthian, that was the lowest thing they could call you. Here's the kicker. Whenever a Corinthian showed up on the Greek theater stage, they were always drunk. That was the perception the world had of Corinth. That's what Paul's fighting for in establishing a church. And the fact that he calls them saints is nothing but astounding. Nothing but astounding. We're going to talk, in fact, I think it's my first point. Yeah. Uh, where did my first point go? There it is. We're going to talk about some of the problems that they were wrestling with. Um, Corinth Essel had a couple other things that made it very prosperous and, and made it very, very uh, attractive to people, especially as far as entertainment was concerned. The Isthmian Games took place in Corinth. That was second only to the Olympic Games. I don't, know, I don't know if you know that or not, but in 1896, they revived the Olympic Games. You do know that, right? The first Olympic Games was in 1896 in Athens, appropriately um, because always before, um, I think every two years or every four years, the Olympic Games would be uh, in Greece on, off of Mount Olympus. And they would bring the best athletes in the area to compete, just like our Olympic Games are about. The Isthmian Games were kind of like the Pan American Games, if you're familiar with track and field. I'm seeing nobody shaking their head, so that was a bad illustration. 
Um, second to the Olympics. So they brought in a lot of world-class athletes and a lot of hundreds of thousands of people to watch these games, which included boxing, included uh, uh, track and field, uh, weight toss, all those kind of things. And if you read 1 Corinthians carefully, Paul brings up those things in, it, in his book because it would have been very, very uh, intimate for them. Also, Paul was a tent maker. And during the Isthmian Games, people needed tents. The vendors needed tents. People needed tents. He sold a lot of tents during the Isthmian Games, almost for sure. And he would have been there during the 51 uh, Isthmian Games, um, 051, not 1951. <laughs> Make sure we're in the same millennium. Um, he was, would have sold a lot of tents. And I don't know how much you know about the writings of the Apostle Paul, but he makes a big deal about being self-sufficient, not asking anybody for money to support his ministry. And the Isthmian Games would have, have allowed him that opportunity to, to be able to do that. Um, I think that's pretty much, yeah, that's pretty much all I wanted to say. Um, Christy, come up and read the first two verses of 1 Corinthians chapter 1 as we begin our journey through the book of 1 Corinthians. Christy's a little tied up right now, so you get me. So if you stand for God's word, 1 Corinthians 1, 1 through 3. Paul called to be an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God and our brother Sosthenes. To the church of God in Corinth, to those sanctified in Christ Jesus and called to be holy, together with all those everywhere who called on the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, their Lord and ours, grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. This is God's word. You may be seated. If you want to pull out your sermon outline, thanks, Mike, and that wasn't a step down. <laughs> did a great job. Pull out the sermon outline. We'll be going through that. The word for the day is saint. Even though they're uh, morally very, 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 very long ways to go, huh, we're going to look at oh, how far they've got to go. Um, the Apostle Paul still calls them saints. So the word for the day is saint. Point number one. What can we learn about the gospel from Corinthians? I believe even though the Corinthians are great sinners, Paul still calls them saints. The temple of God and the body of Christ because they are in Christ. I don't know about you, but to call um, anybody the temple of God is astounding. What did the temple of God represent in the first century? The presence of God. It's where you went to meet God. The apostle Paul calls the believers in, the, in Corinth the temple of God. How are we doing? When people meet you, if you're a believer in Jesus, they should see God. And Paul calls them the temple of God. Listen, this was a messed up people. If you read carefully 1 Corinthians, they're, they're dividing themselves over Who's the greatest preacher that's preached them? And, and listen, a lot of great pe preachers have come to Corinth. Almost for sure, Peter on his way to Rome would have come through Corinth. Uh, we know Apollos was there. Apollos was an absolutely eloquent speech, speaker. The Apostle Paul's there. Um, anybody that's anybody was going to make their way to Corinth because it's a, such an influential city. And they've divided themselves over, well, I follow Paul. No, I follow Paulus. He's a lot more polished. Oh, no, I follow Peter. Well, I follow... Jesus. I'm really spiritual. I follow Jesus. And Paul goes, you're all idiots. We should be united in this. We should be all following Jesus. A couple of chapters later, Paul has to warn them about a guy who's sleeping either with his mother or his mother-in-law. What in the world? But remember, for them, sexual activity is worship. Now, it should be for believers too, but in a whole different sense than what the Corinthians are applying it. If I ever get a chance, I'll 
teach you about that, but um, that's three sermons in itself. I can't even fathom doing that. I can't. A couple, actually one chapter later, he says, you shouldn't be going up the hill to worship with Aphrodite and the prostitutes. Don't you know that anybody you have sex with, you become one flesh with them? You can't become one flesh with the devil. You can't be doing this. And certainly stay away from Apollos, uh, Apollo and, not Apollos, Apollo and uh, the worship there, which, which is in some ways even worse. Then a couple chapters later, he has to warn them, you don't be, shouldn't be going to court against each other in a court of law. Can't you settle this into church? In fact, it'd be better for you to just take the hit and forget about it and drop the whole deal rather than to drag the name of Jesus before a court of law. Then about four chapters later, he, he has, this is unbelievable. He has to sit, tell them, listen, when you take communion and you use real wine, don't get drunk. Did you know that? Paul has to tell them, when you take communion with real wine, don't drink so much you get drunk. That's not how you worship. Although, if you go up the hill, that's how they do worship. You see what Paul's fighting? He has a whole set of presuppositions. He has to absolutely undo and give them a whole new way of looking at worship, of looking at life, looking at everything. And that's what 1 Corinthians is all about. He, he's trying to get them to realize that in Christ, you're a new creation. That's in Corinthians as well. We should have known this, even from the Old Testament, that, that God looks at people in a whole different way than we look at them. Because God calls David a man after God's own heart, and he was a murderer and adulterer. So God's set of values and our set of values are entirely different. We need to adopt God's set of values. Number two, what can we learn about the gospel from Corinthians? Even though the Corinthians think they are spiritual, they are anything but. And Paul still calls them saints. In fact, in verse uh, 1 of chapter 3, Paul says this, Brothers, I could not address you as spiritual, but as worldly. You're merely infants. Why did they think themselves spiritual? Because they could speak in tongues. That for them was the tongue of angels. In fact, the Apostle Paul addresses that very subject in chapter 13 of 1 Corinthians. You'll get to there probably about Christmas time. I'm not sure what pace Pastor, Pastor Dave has got, but that's 13 chapters from now. Listen, that's not what make you, makes you spiritual. It's a spiritual activity. But it doesn't make you spiritual. Listen, just because I play in the praise band doesn't make me spiritual. I may be doing a spiritual activity. Do you see the difference? Nobody's shaking their, one person shaking their head. Listen, folks. Just because you pray doesn't make you spiritual. It's what's going on here. And the Apostle Paul has to undo their thinking that we're the spiritual giants in the, in the, in the whole Roman Empire. And Paul goes, oy vey, you guys got a long ways. In fact, if any church was really had their act together, it would have been Ephesus just around the corner. Actually, just across the sea. Wow, it's really close. <laughs> I just put that in my head. It's just right across the sea. They, they pretty much had their, their act together. Why do you think that Paul has to spend 16 chapters in, in, in book one and I think 13 to 14 chapters in book two? He has to undo all sorts of problems. How many problems does Ephesus have? Doesn't look like any. They think they're spiritual, but they're not. What is spiritual? What does it mean to be spiritual? Did you know that the Apostle Paul didn't consider himself spiritual when he wrote the book of Romans? How does that make you feel? Paul says in Romans chapter 1, verse 14, we know that the law is spiritual, but I 
am unspiritual, sold as a slave to sin. If the Apostle Paul regarded himself as unspiritual, when he's at the maturity level of writing the book of Romans, which is canonized for all of Scripture and probably one of the most beloved of all the New Testament books, if he's unspiritual doing that, where are we? If we even think we are spiritual, we're idiots! That was supposed to be kind of funny, but nobody took it. Does that make sense? You're, you're going to tell me you've obtained the spiritual maturity of the Apostle Paul when he wrote the book of Romans? I don't think so. There's only one person in my entire life that I think would have a shot at that. Oh boy, that's a painful subject. I won't go there. Well, no, I will. He was a former bishop in the Free Methodist Church. The most godly man I've ever met. Most spiritual man I've ever met. Spiritual basically means be like Jesus. Not be hung up on the physical, but the metaphysical. That which is above physical. That which is spiritual. That which is not material. That's what it means to be spiritual. It means to, to be in harmony with the will of God. Like Jesus was. There's only one person I met in all of my life, and it was a free Methodist bishop. And unfortunately, the free Methodist church allowed him, some people say, got railroaded out of office. Listen very, very carefully. There is only one qualifications one qualification you should look at when you're looking at anybody in spiritual leadership, and that's to ask the question of them, are they spiritual? Are they trying to be in harmony with the God of the universe? I don't care how polished they are. I don't care what gender they are. I don't care what ethnicity they are. I don't care what political motivation they may have. Are they living as close as they can to being in harmony with Jesus? And a lot of denominations have forfeited that qualification for gender, ethnicity, political correctness, all these other things. Folks, that's the death of the church. That's good preaching, Pastor Keith. My home denomination, the United Brethren in Christ, I spent the first 22 years of my life in that denomination, went the way of the political correct leaders. They're nearly dead now. There's hardly even a heartbeat in that whole denomination. The United Methodist Church is not far behind. Presbyterian Church USA is not far behind. Why? Why? Because they forgot what qualifications they need to look for in a leader. Look for one who's spiritual. Look for one who understands their sinfulness and is looking to the mercy and grace of God for their forgiveness. Not that they think they've arrived because they know they haven't. The really spiritual person knows they're a sinner. We'll cover that on page two. Number three, what can we, oh, by the way, I'm going to move fairly quickly between now and the, the, the uh, spiritual challenge, which is the next last point. I'm going to spend a lot of time there. So a lot of you are going to think, yes, we're going to get out of here by noon. It's not true. <laughs> but I'll keep it moving. Number three, what can we learn about the gospel from Corinthians? Number three, even though the Corinthians resist correction, Paul still calls them saints. Why in the world does Paul begin his letter by saying, I'm an apostle of Christ Jesus, called by God to be an apostle, and it's God's will for me to be an apostle? Why this emphasis about him being called by God and it's God's will for him to be an apostle? I'll tell you why. Because they looked at the apostle Paul as an idiot and as a, a kind of a loser. And who are you, Paul, to tell us how to live our lives? Reason why? Why? 
because Paul was not slick and attractive and uh, suave. <laughs> he was rough. In fact, a lot of people say from the, the second century that may have had contact with the Apostle Paul, he may, may have been a hunchback with bad eyes and a lisp and bald. Probably shouldn't have went there. <laughs> In other words, he wasn't like, a, like Apollos. Polished, sophisticated, eloquent, intelligent, very, very uh, excellent in the way of his delivery. The Apostle Paul makes that confession several times in his letters, if you read them. I didn't come to be eloquent. I came to show you God's power. And God's power only comes by being in touch with the God of the universe and realizing you can't get there on your own. And so Paul's trying to offer correction to the Corinthians, but they're resisting. That's why Paul starts his letter. Hey, I'm an apostle of Jesus, just like the other 12 guys were. I, I'm called by God, and it's the will of God that I came to you. Are you going to fight that? They do. They do. Whew. One of the most disturbing things, and I saw this happen. I was... I was actually aware in 1960 when the Nixon-Kennedy uh, election took place for President of the United States, I actually watched the debate on TV and saw Kennedy as a candidate just looking youthful and refreshed and, and really, really handsome. And Nixon had, hadn't had time to shave in two days. And he just had bags under his eyes and was wore out because of the, the vigorous schedule he had. And Nixon didn't understand the power of image. And so he went on TV looking ragged and, and run down. Nixon was way ahead in the polls. But Kennedy beat him. Why? Because Kennedy looked good. And folks, I don't know if you know this or not, but the American voter leans towards those candidates that look good. That's stupid. I'm sorry. That's not why you elect somebody to lead you. And Paul didn't look good. In fact, I'm amazed at the number of godly people and godly leaders who, if you looked at them, you'd walk on the other side of the street. You think John the Baptist was an attractive guy? He was a wild man. He looks, Duck Dynasty looked sophisticated. <laughs> and who did John the Baptist pattern his appearance after? Elijah. And yet we will shut them off because they don't look good. The only thing that should matter is, do they speak God's truth? Are they telling me what I need to know in order to make the necessary corrections in my life so I can be more like Jesus? And those presuppositions that we have built in our head hang on for a long time, folks. They are hard to break. I want to read you a story that just I, I can relate to in so many different ways because my head knows what I need to do, but my heart just won't go there. You ever had that struggle? The Apostle Paul did. Just read the book of Romans, chapter 7. He's struggling big time between his heart and his head. This story is from uh, Nazi Germany. It's late summer, 1945. The guy's name is, uh, I'm not sure his name, but he's writing to his lover, uh, Greta, and he's at an airfield that the Russians have just overrun. And he's trying to hold down the fort because he's relying on a promise that Hitler had made to him. This is what he says in his letter to his lover. We are entirely alone, without help from outside. Hitler has left us in the lurch. If the airfield is still in our possession, this letter still may get out. So this is what the end looks like. Haynes and I will not surrender. Yesterday, after our infantry had retaken a position, I saw four men who had been taken prisoner by the Russians. No, we shall not go into captivity. When Stalingrad has fallen, you'll hear and read it, and then you'll know that I shall not come back. <laughs> 
the Fuhrer made a firm promise to bail us out of here. They read it to us and we believed it firmly. Even now, I still believe it because I have to believe in something. If it's not true, what else could I believe in? I would no longer need spring, summer, or anything else that gives pleasure. So leave me my faith, dear Greta. All my life, at least the last eight years of it, I believed in the Fuhrer and his word. It is terrible how they doubt here and shameful to listen to what they say without being able to reply because they have the facts on their side. Do you hear what he's saying? I know in my head that Hitler has abandoned us and we're on our own and we're, it's not good. But I have to hang on to something and so I'll hang on to the promises of Adolf Hitler. Folks, that battle goes on endlessly inside every one of us. And it goes on big time in the heart and soul of the Corinthians because their whole idea of worship is now being destroyed by the Apostle Paul. And they're going, what? You mean this activity isn't honoring to God? No. No. We have several things that God has given us to know whether or not we're dealing with reality. He's given us our senses and, and to look at all in nature, <laughs> which our whole culture has abandoned big time. Anyway, he's given us our reason, our heads, which our whole culture has abandoned big time. <laughs> and he's given us a spirit within us to alert us. I was in a conversation this morning. Um, I got here about... Uh, 715 and there's a person that comes real early in the morning to make sure everything is ready for you all. Uh, she comes actually at 530 in the morning to get everything ready so it's ready for you to, to worship. And I was talking to her and she says, you know, really strange thing happened to me yesterday. I was crying all day. I didn't know why. I was crying and crying and crying. And then at seven o'clock last night, I got the word that my granddaughter was going to be able to receive a new kidney. And then I realized that's why I was crying. She didn't know the entire day, but her spirit knew. How much are 21st century Americans in touch with their spirit? We don't even think it exists. And yet it's the most important part of us. Also, if you don't want to go along with, with those three things, you can go along with the Wesleyan quadrilateral. I've mentioned this before. If you look at the, the clock tower at uh, Spring Harbor University, you can see the four pillars of uh, what, how we can realize if we're dealing with reality, not from uh, Wesleyan quadrilateral, which is four things. Scripture, uh, reason, our heads, tradition, which Western church is totally ignorant about, except for my granddaughter, Lacey, you probably don't even know about Aquinas or Augustine or Chrysostom or uh, what's the other guy's name? Just went blank. We need to learn about those people, folks. Which one? Augustine. That's the one I was thinking of. Do you know, that's, thanks baby, because I wanted to make this point. Do you know we are Protestants today because of a guy that lived in 425 AD by the name of St. Augustine? Well, it wasn't St. at that particular time. It wasn't in Florida either. It's named after him. How much do you know about Augustine? Martin Luther knew a lot. That's what drove him to the Reformation. We need to learn about that. So, Scripture is Ford Quadrado, the Western Quadrado Scripture, reason, experience, and tradition. Those are the four things we can look at in order to know if we need correction in our lives or if this person is just being an idiot. Worship point is this. Worship the God of the universe whose grace, forgiveness, holiness, mercy, love, and compassion are scandalously wonderful. Even though these Corinthians are seriously lost, Paul tells them this. God made him who had no sin to become sin for us so that in him 
we might become the righteousness of God. Did you hear that? If we trust in Jesus, who had no sin, he takes all of our sin and puts it upon him, and we now become just as righteous as God himself. Yes! Because, folks, if there's anything I know about myself, I know I'm a desperate sinner. I'm surprised this lady right in here didn't go, Amen, Pastor Keith. That's my wife. She knows I'm a sinner. And God has given me his righteousness as a gift if I trust in Jesus. Gospel application. The gospel is not about your ethical or moral ability, but about who you trust to save you. The gospel is not about your spiritual IQ, but about faith in Jesus. The gospel is not about how quick you are to repent, but about knowing where your righteousness comes from. The gospel is not about choosing the right pastor, but about choosing the right Savior. It's Jesus plus nothing. When I was growing up in the United Brethren Church, I got a lot of legalistic teaching, and I became a legalist. And I'll tell you what, that demon dies hard. I have to be very, very careful. In fact, some of my messages, I want to go back and make a, a, a disclaimer about them. I, I gave you the impression that you need to do this to be saved. That's totally bogus. It's Jesus plus nothing. Not Jesus plus circumcision. Not Jesus plus going to church. Not Jesus plus tithing. Not Jesus plus obedience to the law. It's Jesus plus Nothing! There's an entire book called the book of Galatians that written in order to make that point. It's not your sin that will keep you out of heaven. It's your thinking that you're righteous enough that you no longer need Jesus. And folks, some of you are there. And Jesus had not good things to say about it in Luke chapter 18, the passage that was read to you earlier. The publican and the Pharisee. Who went home justified? The one who said, whoa, I'm glad I'm not like that person. Or the one who said, Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. I have a cool story about John Newton. I'll just give you a real quick one. He, uh, he AWOLed out of the Navy, went into the slave trade, uh, got fed up with the abuse going on in the slave trade, so uh, left his, his crew, hailed another ship from the coast of Africa at, with a smoke signal, got on another ship. While he was on that ship, uh, they were going back to Scotland. He broke into the rum cabinet and got the entire crew drunk. He was so drunk, he fell overboard. And the only reason he was saved is a, a, one of the, the officers took a harpoon and threw it at him and speared him in the leg and then dragged him in like a fish. That's the only way that John Newton was saved. That same cruise, they were coming into Scotland, came into a bad storm, washed him all the way out, and the ship started to tank on water. And he was forced to go down with the slaves in the, in the bilge down down blow and pump water out for days and after a couple of days of being in that environment i don't know how much you know about slave holds but that's where the filth goes that's where the body odor is that's where the yucky stuff is he was down there for days bilging out water he finally realizes god help me i'm i'm in big trouble here can you please help me god saved him and john newton's the one that wrote amazing grace how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. Do you see yourself as a wretch? Listen, in your standard by yourself without Jesus, all of us are. I don't care how long you've been a Christian. We still are in need of a Savior Every single minute of every single day. I'll never forget the day I went home to my Sunday school class at my home church. 
And I, my wife and I had been married several years. We went into the class, and one of the class members said, you know, I don't think I'm going to be coming to Sunday school anymore. I've arrived in my spiritual maturity. I don't think I need any this anymore. I was about ready to come after him. <laughs> Who has the audacity to say that? I'm serious. Look in the cotton picking mirror. Spiritual challenge. Can we believe that we too are incredibly sinful? We can't even fulfill God's two greatest commandments. And even our works are righteous, are, 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 even our works of righteousness are like dirty tampons. And you're going, Pastor Keith, why would you even say that? Because the Bible does. It's just gutless enough not to give you the real words. Your NIV translators go, whoa, we can't use that word. Because our audience will be offended. There's a lot of things in the New Testament that they soften so that you're not offended. You need to be offended! It says, menstrual cloth. But what's a menstrual cloth? A dirty tampon. Some of you are deeply offended. You're going to be really glad I'm not here next week. <laughs> I don't care. <laughs> I don't get paid to do this anyway. It's freeing when nobody can hold anything over your head. It's freeing when nobody can hold anything over your head for a moral failure because you've already confessed it to God. I'm absolutely convinced if you'll listen to the teaching of Jesus and apply it to your heart, you become invincible. Nobody can stop you. Nobody can intimidate you or manipulate you or coerce you into doing anything because you faced it all. And you're not looking to yourself to save yourself anyway. You're looking to Jesus. Pascal said in Pensis, there are only two kinds of men. This is in your sermon line. The righteous who think they are sinners and the sinners who think they are righteous. And this next one by Bernard de Clavel, which is, by the way, one of these tradition people from the Middle Ages that I talked to you about. He's about 800 years ago, he said this. Our sense of sin is in proportion to our nearness to God. God is light. And if light does anything, I know it does this. It reveals things you can't see unless you have an intense light. It's one of the reasons why I like to have the drapes, the shades up <laughs> in, in worship. But I'm not in control of that. Why? Because I need God's light to shine on my soul in order to reveal the areas of my life that is not right. And as long as I live in darkness, as long as I live away from God, as long as I don't spend time in his word, as long as I don't consult his spirit, as long as I don't deal with other Christians, as long as I don't listen to my wife, I can live in darkness forever. But the minute the light shines on my soul, I go, ooh, whoa, Porter. You got something that needs to be changed here. And lots of times, it's so big of a rut, it's a major battle to try to get that changed. I have a quote that's by Tim Keller. It's in your sermon online. I'm not going to take time to read it right now. But it talks about having that power because you've been able to confess your sins. And also have them, having the humility that keeps you from being proud if you think you've arrived. Both extremes are spiritual death. Being absolutely devastated because of your sin or being absolutely proud thinking you haven't, have no sin. But a right relationship with Jesus puts you right smack where you need to be. Empowered and yet humble, just like Jesus. Martin Luther, I love him. 
He was, he was just like the Apostle Paul, just fearless sometimes. <laughs> the Apostle Paul was fearless all the time. Have you read the book of Acts? My goodness, he goes into one town, gets the ever-living tar beat out of him, then gets up and says, well, let's go to the next town and do it all again. Paul, take a vacation. <laughs> Why? Because he couldn't help himself. Martin Luther wrote a letter to a guy who was in the hospital because he felt guilty about advice or counsel he had given to somebody else. And so he's sick because of, of his, this, blunt, this spiritual blunder he's made. Martin Luther writes to this guy who's in the hospital suffering from the guilt that he, that is, of a poor decision that he made. This is what he says in his letter. My faithful request and admonition is that you join our company and associate w with us who are real, great, and hard-boiled sinners. You must by no means make Christ to seem paltry and trifling to us as though he could be our helper only when we want to be rid of imaginary, nominal, and childish sins. No, no, no. That would not be good for us. He must rather be a savior and a redeemer from great, real, grievous, and damnable transgressions and iniquities, yea, from the very greatest and most shocking sins, to be brief from all sins added together in grand to total. Dr. Stopitz comforted me on a certain occasion when I was a patient in the same hospital, suffering from the same affliction you're going through. Ah, he said to me, you want to be a painted sinner? And accordingly, expect to have in Christ a painted Savior? You'll have to get used to belief that Christ is a real Savior. And that you are a real sinner. For God is neither jesting nor dealing in imaginary affairs. But he was greatly and most assuredly in earnest when he sent his own son into the world and sacrificed him. For our sakes. You want a great sinner? I mean, you want a great savior? You need to see yourself as a great sinner. One of my favorite passages is seven, sorry, Luke 747. I almost said Boeing 747. <laughs> because that's how I remember it. It's a great passage, big, powerful, carries a lot of weight. You know what Luke 747 is? It's where Jesus has his feet washed by the tears of the woman and then his feet dried by her hair. Do you know what Jesus says about her? She loves much because she's been forgiven much. Most of you don't know how much God loves you because you don't know how big a sinner you are. So I'm here to help. Two greatest commandments, Jesus said, love God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. Love your neighbors yourself. Two greatest commandments. So if you break them, would it not be the two greatest sins? How you doing? I know where I'm at. I'm not sure I can look to, any, look to any more than five seconds of my life where I've loved God with all my heart, mind, soul, and strength. And I know there's never been a time where I've loved my neighbor with all the energy, resources, and sacrifice that I'm willing to give to myself that I'm willing to pour into my neighbor. I've never done that. Which makes me, if I understand Jesus right, a bigger sinner than an adulterer and murderer. So if you're having problems with your sin, if you're having problems with understanding yourself as a sinner, I just double dare dog you, double dog dare you to look at those two and say, honestly, looking in the mirror, do I love God with all my heart, with all my soul, with all my strength, with all my mind? And do I love my neighbors or myself? And if you can't say yes to both of them, then you're at exactly the place where Jesus wants you to be.
knowing your need for a savior and coming to him for salvation, not looking to your own righteousness, but to look to his righteousness to allow you to be saved. Cheer up, folks. You're a whole lot worse than you think you are. But cheer up. God is more gracious and forgiving and kind than you ever dreamed or imagined. And by coming to a knowledge of your great sin, you come also at the same time to a knowledge of a great Savior who loves you dearly. And has gone to great lengths to save you. So what? Allow God to empower you. This is the next frame, by the way. Yeah, it's up there. Allow God to empower and to free you by helping you to recognize what a sinner you are and how gracious God has been to you. Then you'll be free from games, pretense, acting, and pride. You will really enjoy freedom and grace and be empowered to really love. I want to close with an illustration that I think... Uh, does a good job of illustrating what I'm trying to say over the last 40 minutes or so. There was one time a banker who was a devout Christian. All of his life, for 89 years of his life, he had been devoted to Christ, um, tithed regularly, in fact, tithed plus. Uh, regularly was a Sunday school teacher, always there on, on three days a week for the church, helped out with all sorts of mission projects, gave... Uh, graciously to people in need, just an outstanding Christian, served on the board, served on the trustees, um, great community person. This banker was known throughout the community. What an outstanding individual he is. He dies. This is a made-up story, by the way. This is not, thus saith the Lord. He dies, and it finds himself at the pearly gates. And guess who's at the pearly gates? St. Peter. You, you all know that, right? I'm realizing how dated my illustrations are. Just imagine the pearly gates with St. Peter. He walks up to Peter and says, Peter, I'm so glad to be here. And Peter says, wait a minute, wait a minute. Before you can enter, you need to have 2,000 points. And the guy goes, what? Nobody ever told me about 2,000 points before you could get into heaven. This is a made-up story. So Peter says, oh yeah, I can't let you in unless you have 2,000 points. So the guy starts to recite all that he's done, the, the gifts that he's given, the tithing, the faithful dedication to the church, support of the pastors, support of missionaries, on and on. He's going straight for 30 minutes, on and on and on. He goes and goes, and, and he says, Peter, how am I doing? Peter goes, well, that's a half a point. He goes, oh no, God have mercy. Peter goes, that's it. 2,000 points. Come on in. God have mercy on me, a sinner. The most tragic thing I've ever faced in ministry was one day when a parishioner came to me and said, do you guys know Ted Bundy? That name familiar? Back in the 80s, he killed like 28 women, had sex with them, and then killed them. Serial killer. Anyway, James Dobson had an interview with him while he was in prison about a week before he was executed. And a lot of people believe he was saved. When I showed that video in our church, this is not this church, a long time ago in the 80s. When I showed the video in church, a parishioner came up to me and said this, if Ted Bundy is in heaven, I don't want to be there. I was absolutely emptied. Ma'am, when you just said that to me, you're worse than Ted Bundy. Let's pray. God, help us to understand it's only your righteousness that's going to count. Help us to get off of riding on our egos and our pride and our self-assurance, thinking that what we do is going to earn our way into heaven. Boy, if anybody thinks that, they have a really small view of righteousness. They really have a small view of you. Because there's nothing we can do. Help us to come to you daily. No, minute by minute. 
humble, and yet joyful. Knowing that with you, there is forgiveness, there is grace, there is peace, there is love, there's life. Help us not to look to our own self and our own righteousness, but to yours. That's why we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.